Jordans and Jordans. How does the sneaker industry function as a stock market? Only like 23 of these have been made. And you get all this in the box over on StockX. I'm Josh Luber, CEO over at StockX. What are you looking for in terms of sneakers tonight? Nobody pray for me. It been a day for me. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I remember syrup sandwiches and crime allowances. Finessing on them with some counterfeits. But now I'm counting this. Parmesan with my accountant. Welcome to StockX TV. I'm here with Eminem to pick up shoes for the charity auction on StockX. I'm here with Eminem too. There's, you know, the ones, the threes, the fours, the elevens. Those are shoes that I remember as a kid being like, those are amazing, those are incredible. I got my Yeezys, got my NMDs, I wore the shit out of these too. StockX and Eminem partnered for a hurricane relief campaign, and we raised almost $450,000. So you gotta get those. You don't have a pair of Jordans, you gotta get those. $52,000. These are via StockX, right? The most important sneaker in shoe wear history. It's crazy to see that something like sneakers can have this type of an effect. We've launched watches, handbags, and streetwear. What if there was a stock market of things? Hold up. What the f is a sneaker stock market? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of StockX, Josh Luber. And returning to the stage, Chief Executive Officer of Ignition Media Group, founding partner of Archer Corporate Services, and the chair of the 2019 Detroit Policy Conference, Dennis Archer Jr. Hey, you got the chair. We'll figure it out. All right, so first, for those of you who don't know, that was 50 Cent and Eminem in the video. In case there's some cultural education that's gonna go on here. Uh -huh. But uh, how many By people. The way, I shot that myself with the GoPro. It was just me and 50 in a room for an hour shooting that. And he's like, let's do it again, let's do it again. It so was, if this all yeah. fails, you can do video production. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So how many people were here for Dan Gilbert's session? All right, so yeah, he did a good job. <laughs> so, this, so this morning. He might you still know, be here. Dan, yeah. Yeah, you know, he's gone. But Dan. Um, was giving me, I have a, a birthday coming up, and so he was giving me uh, the business about that, but he was saying that you had a birthday. <laughs> and he was saying how he explained uh -huh. to you um, as part of your fashion presentation that at some point, when you go from 41 to 45, that your hat should go uh -huh. a little bit towards the front, towards 45, so at 45, it's facing the front. I completely disagree. I, I dig it. Thank how you. It I, is. I've just always wanted to be like Ken Griffey Jr., right? That was, you know. <laughs> that was his thing. Yeah, and, and so now I can't. It, what's funny is that Dan has been by far the biggest supporter of Just Be Yourself, and not just for me, but like through the entire uh, family of companies. And it was really, uh, really early on, and we were going on CNBC together, and he was like the co host of Squawk Box. And we were on CNBC. I was like, Do you want me to like wear something different? He's like, No, we wear what you want to wear. So right. it's, uh, it's good and it, it helps. And, and by the way, like there's people at StockX that wear hoodies and sweatshirts. There's people that, that want to wear a suit and tie because that's what they want to wear. And that's a fun place to create a business where you can have that kind of culture. So, so talking about tie, uh, yeah. Katie was backstage giving you a little grief on your tie. Uh -huh. But you were explaining to me how it came with the shoes. What, what shoes are these, by right. the way? So it's very rare that I get up and someone's not going to ask me what shoes uh, I'm wearing. Right. Um, this, these are a pair of shoes. This is called a um, Asics, uh, which is the brand. Gel Light 3 is the, the model. And this is a, a collaboration with a boutique in Singapore uh, called Limited Edition. And it literally came with this tie, and it's the same pattern, which is, I suppose, the only way I buy ties um, these days anymore. So I figured that it would be a good... So how many, what quantity of these were these, produced? This is a really good example where, because the whole thing is supply and demand, right? StockX right. is, is Econ 101 at its most basic. Um, and the, these shoes were super uh, limited, but they were also have very little demand because it was this shoe that released in Singapore that people really weren't aware of. And so I actually looked this morning. There's only about two or three pairs even for sale on StockX. Going and for. And they're only about 200 bucks, which is what, really? what about retail was. And it's a good example. Most people assume that StockX is all $1,000 sneakers and $50,000 watches. But about a quarter of the shoes that we sell today are, are less than retail. And we'll talk more about this. But like the future of StockX is selling sneakers to everybody. Right. It's not just $1,000 <laughs> shoes. It's a person that bought their last pair of shoes at Foot Locker or Nike.com that never would have tried to wade through eBay four years ago to buy a pair of, of interesting or different shoes. 
and now. And so StockX is, is really just about access. So I want to go through the evolution. Uh, we're going to, uh, with the assistance of Wale, yeah. see how it works. And I, we may even get on the laptop and let you find me some shoes. But talk about the story, because you, when we first met, and I asked you, I mean, this is the truest entrepreneurial story. Um, and I don't want to give it all away about, but you know, calling your wife, look, I'm staying another night, I can't leave. Yeah. You know, talk about the evolution from campless, your, your days at IBM, your fascination with sneaker valuation, how you started camp, campless, and then how you, it evolved into a relationship with Dan. Yeah, that story, is, it's a, um, a long and, and crazy story. We'll give the abbreviated version, but it's, um, the, the short of it, and we'll, and we'll come back to some of it, the short of it is there was maybe one other person in the whole world that had the exact same idea at the exact same time as me, and it happens to be Dan, which is crazy for so many reasons. I'd never met him, I'd never been to Detroit, um, and, um, but for me, it was very much sort of ground up. I've collected sneakers since I was eight. Right? I have the exact same story as every other 41-year-old sneakerhead, which is I grew up playing basketball and Jordan played. I always wanted Air Jordans. My mom would never buy me Air Jordans. As I got some money, I bought Air Jordans. Like, we all have the exact same story. And, um, and so I'm a startup guy, and I've started to run a couple other startups before this, and, and it always sort of separated business and pleasure and never really worked in the sneaker industry. And, um, and I shut down my last startup in the crash of 08, 09, and I moved to New York, and, uh, and I take a job at IBM, and I was a consultant at IBM. And if you are a startup guy and you go work at IBM, the first thing you do is you start working on stuff on the side. So I'm a consultant, I'm doing all this data work at IBM, and so the question was, and this is like 2011, 2012, eBay is still the largest marketplace for sneakers, and so the question was, can we get a hold of sneaker data just to play with, just to play with for my own amusement, just to kind of see what we could do with it? And we were able to collect eBay data, we were able to, to clean it, and basically build a price guide for sneakers. And that was the, a company called Campless, and, and started that in 2012. And over the next couple of years, it became sort of the default price guide in the sneaker industry. Um, brands started using it. We started selling data. We had a blog that was kind of like Freakonomics for sneakers. But really, the whole time, I'm just trying to figure out, like, how do you leave IBM? What is this business? What do you do with it? And I talked to everybody in the sneaker industry, Nike, eBay, Foot Locker, Complex, like, you name it. And there was never really a good fit. And, um, and then one day, I get a totally random email from a few guys. And like, you know, hey, we work with Dan Gilbert. Really interested in what you're doing. Can we talk? Dan's got no ties to the sneaker industry, but sure. And, um, and there's this sort of long backstory. We end up in the same room together. They basically kidnapped me and took me to a Cavs game, which is a pretty good recruiting tool just in general. Absolutely. I, I've been using that for four years. It works really well, actually. Um, and, uh, and so we end up in a room together, and, and I take out this one piece of paper, and I had this one piece of paper that I created in 2012 that was like this roadmap of what I thought you could do with this business. And it was really simple. There were only three things on this piece of paper. The first was a price guide, and that's what our business was. The second was this idea of sneaker portfolios. So if you know the value of one pair of sneakers, I can very easily look at your whole sneaker collection the same way you look at a stock portfolio and just right. track its value over time. And then the logic was, well, if you understood asset pricing and you understood portfolio construction, then perhaps you could actually operate this as a stock market for sneakers. And that was the idea, but it was a very pie-in-the-sky idea. I'm not a developer. There's no way I could have built that. And, um, and so anyway, so I took that piece of paper to every one of these meetings, Nike, eBay, Foot Locker, and everybody said, oh, that's pretty cool. But what we want to do is this, and we want to take your data and do X, Y, and Z in our business. And fair enough, right? I didn't think Nike was going to change their whole business and build a stock market. And so I share it with Dan, and they look at me with pure shock, and it doesn't really register to me why. And then they take out a piece of paper and they're like, yeah, we have one of those. That is exactly what we want to build, a stock market for sneakers. And so the crazy, like, I literally showed up the meeting thinking, I'm going to have to convince these guys to build a stock market for sneakers. And they showed up the meeting thinking, we got to convince this guy to build a stock market for sneakers. Which is just crazy on, on so many reasons. And Dan was exposed to sneakers through his kids, and, and he'd always had this sort of bigger idea around a stock market of things. that You could buy or sell anything right. using the stock market mechanics. And so that is the short version of it. It was a really crazy long story. It led to me selling Campus to Dan, becoming partners with him, and, and turning Campus as the data layer into StockX, the, the marketplace. And so that was uh, 2015. We launched the business in 2016, in February 2016. We're three years and two weeks old. And um, now we have 650 people, um, over a billion dollar run rate, um, four categories, whatever, six countries, I don't know. It, it's, can we talk to, go, yeah. can we, let's talk about talent for a second, because you're bringing up yeah. the hiring. So, you know, I happen to know just from communicating with you, while the company hired 600 folks in 
2018, there's a capacity to hire that many folks this year, but it's been a challenge filling some positions. So how important is the availability of talent in Detroit to the success of your business? Yeah, um, there's nothing that's more important to the company than people. Um, and I spend a lot of my time doing things like this, I'm on the road a lot, talking to, to brands a lot, how do we work with Nike, Adidas, um, but the only part of the day-to-day -day business I'm still 100% keyed in on it is hiring, and it's people. Um, we hired about 500 people last year. Um, to be fair, ha about half of our 650 is, is operations, so we physically authenticate every single product that's sold. After it's sold, the seller ships it to us. We make sure it's real, we make sure it's the right size, right condition, it is what it's supposed to be, and then we send it to the buyer. And so we have four authentication centers, uh, one's here in Detroit and Corktown, uh, one's in Tempe, Arizona, one's in, uh, outside of New York City, and one's in London. And we'll open up two more this year, I think Tokyo and, uh, and Amsterdam. And, um, and so about half the, half the staff is, is that, and then the other half is, is office, and the two biggest teams are engineering and customer service. And so as we grow, we have to hire more operations, and, you have to, and some of that will be in other cities. Um, but then, you know, the, from the business team, um, this past year was about building capacity, both in terms of operational, but also in, in talent. I mean, every one of our bottlenecks, 100% of our bottlenecks today are people. Mm -hmm. And we've hired most of the senior and mid-senior leadership level, but we still don't have a, a CFO, CTO, CMO. We still, by the way, we're, we're hiring. CFO, that's, the, that's literally the only reason I do anything anymore is, is we're hiring. Um, and, um, but also, as we go into other categories, we have to have leaders for those categories that know that product, right? I was the leader for sneakers, but you know, I wear a $6 shoelace. Like, I was not the guy who's gonna lead watches, right? right. Um, and so we're still looking for, for senior category leadership in, uh, in handbags and women's and luxury, for art, which is the next vertical. We're about to go into in, in art. And so some of these big senior roles are really important, and what we've had a great success of, one, hiring in Detroit, but also, bring people back to Detroit, right? right? About a quarter of the, the office non-operations team we've brought from other cities. And, um, and I spend a lot of my time out there recruiting and bringing people back. And you get two people. You get either people that left Detroit and are looking for a reason to move back, which is phenomenal. Um, and then you get other people that are, are interested in uh, StockX. And you know, almost everybody goes through the same uh, process, which is, ooh, StockX, that's awesome. Oh, you, Detroit, you think I can work remote? And I say, just come and see, right? And we don't even have the conversation until we bring them in, give them the tour of Detroit, give them the tour of StockX, right? And, uh, and immediately that breaks down all it's the barriers. It's a game changer. Getting them here is a game changer. We don't even like try to engage in the conversation until we get them here and go through the process. And by the way, we don't even have the interviews until they go on the tour of Detroit and see what's going on. And it changes everyone's perception. And then all of a sudden, we're on the same footing as every other city, and we can have the conversation. So you were talking about the process, the authentication. Maggie has a, a great video that she's going to play right now. Mm -hmm. It's going to, with Wale, another cultural educational moment for you guys. It's going to walk through, and it's going to show us uh, exactly how this works. And we'll come back and talk about it. Yeah. So you want to buy a pair of black Seaman 3s, huh? A real pair. And you want the best price? Where do you even start? Hey. Here's a thousand auction listings. Take two energy drinks and call me in the morning. How do I even know if the shoe is real? What's a fair price for it? And if I have a problem, is the seller going to even take care of me? Oh, yeah. A sneaker is a commodity. It should be dead simple to buy a dead stock pair. Welcome to Stock X, an actual stock market for sneakers. It's actually a stock market of things. At StockX, a transaction occurs when a bid and then ask me. A buyer wants to buy a size 10 black cement. He submits a bid, the price he's willing to pay. Now the entire world knows it's a legit offer because it's tied to his PayPal account. He can go about his day in confidence knowing that if someone is selling for 550, he'll cop. Is that a fing daiquiri? Yeah, bro. A seller has a size 10 black cement. She can place an ask or a listing for sale. If she sees someone that has placed a bid for 550, she can sell it immediately. With two clicks, done deal. Am I the only one not drinking a beach drink? But how do I know if these are real? Hassan, come on, really? What? Every pair of sneakers sold on StockX passes through our trading floor. With dudes who look like James Harden, make sure you never get scammed ever again. Now that's a legit check. 
The only thing more legit would be if dudes who look like Wale come in and do the voiceovers. I always find it amazing. People always clap for the video, which is like, I, it's great. I guess they like the video. And they never clap for the people. They I never know. clapping for us. I know. Clapping for videos. We got to do better. Thank you. No, that wasn't a begging for applause, kind of. But um, that was, so we created that video in April of 2016. We launched in February. So that was like our, our launch video. And we were trying at the time to, the, the, the whole thing, the whole premise of StockX being based on how the stock market works is a pretty good theory, right? The stock market has been the most efficient form of commerce for 150 years. So for us, we were trying to figure out how do we productize that, right? How do we create a website where 14-year-old kids can buy or sell shoes and we don't have to teach 14-year-old kids how the stock market works, right? right? That was the challenge for us in the beginning. And so this video was our attempt in the beginning to explain that and, and try to do that. And, you know, I, I think it, it came out pretty well and it actually has won all sorts of awards and it's got like 15 million views and it's awesome. And we even started running a version of that now on TV as we've been moving into mass market for, uh, for, uh, for TV, for general awareness. And it's really cool, it talks about you know, what and, and what we do, but it doesn't talk about the, like, the why, like the bigger right. idea of the whole thing. And that's the fun part about StockX is like, we're the largest uh, marketplace for sneakers and streetwear, but it's really about that like, next layer, not only other products, but then we get to work with brands and release products and, and become an alternate retail channel. And so like, the bigger idea of StockX is, um, is pretty big and, uh, and we're slowly starting to get there. So, anyway. so talk about the, differ the differentiator because there is some competition. Yeah. But not everyone authenticates. Not everyone limits it only to dead stock. Yeah. And so that really puts you in a category by yourself. Yeah, um, and it's actually like a perfect segue because um, those two parts separate us from a, a many, many people. And dead stock is, um, is brand new, right, Un unworn. Um, and, um, but, and, and by the way, we have, we have uh, uh, competitors in every category, in sneakers and watches and handbags. Um, and that's the start of what we think is the value of, of the model, but it's that larger uh, idea of the stock market of things, transparency of data. Um, authenticity is almost the ante to play, right? It, it's, it's kind of the red herring. There's a tremendous amount of value they get from authenticity, and not a lot of people do it, but some people do. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's replicable. Anyone, if they wanted to and put in the time to build that process, can do that. We don't yet have any direct competitors on the model. There's no one that has gone and, and tried to take the same uh, approach to creating a, a genuinely a, a new type of, of commerce. And, um, and that's kind of a nice place to be because that's why this, this thing has worked so well. That's why it, is, it has grown so fast is that we get people in the door through authenticity you know, and, and being able to sell brand new shoes. But it's really about the experience of, of going through the, the stock market mechanics. And that's, that's the bigger idea. I'm going to, and it, we've got some time. And it, mm -hmm. shortly I want to hop on and help you, help me find some shoes. Sure. Or maybe a watch also. If his credit card's on there, he's in trouble. I don't know, I'll try to get my dad's. Mm -hmm. He's out there. Um, <laughs> talk to about, you know, the, the theme of this conference is Detroit 2030. So we've been talking about this morning different people's vision for what Detroit looks like in 2030. And then what we have to do between now and then to be able to achieve that vision. So, you know, what, how do you see Detroit in 2030? And how does that relate to, you're saying you're bringing all these people in, you're trying to shop Detroit for people to come in and, yeah. and, and work here. What does Detroit look like in 2030 that makes that job very easy for you? First of all, I just want to say it is humbling that I get to have that conversation and be a part of that. Whereas, you know, three years ago when we were starting this, it was, you know, we're, we're four guys, you know, sitting outside of Dan's office just trying to, to figure out how we, how we build a product and, and to have a company that employs 650 people. But it's truly day zero around here right now. And that's the interesting part about sort of looking at the future because the headquarters is, will remain in Detroit. And whatever happens as we, as we grow, do we IPO, um, you know, do we someone like Amazon or eBay buy us and you do that. But the headquarters will remain in Detroit. We'll continue to employ a lot of people in Detroit. And... We sit, you know, we sit right next to Dan. Dan's office and his team is on one half of the floor and ours is on the other. And so we don't work on Detroit initiatives per se, but we sit right there. We're right, right. in the middle of it. And every day, looking out the window and onto Campus Marshes, there's a new restaurant, there's a new building. Like, we live in a startup city. And if you're an entrepreneur, and particularly for us, and I want to hire as many startup people as possible into, like, 
what a better place to be part of a startup and then being part of a startup city. And that's the really, I think, interesting part because like, I've started to run three other startups before this in much more you know, established normal cities and now you get to be part of all of it. And so anyway, that's, that's my viewpoint in, in it of, of, of sort of living in a startup city. So we've got the blue cards on your table, by the way. So if you have questions, you can turn them in and they'll make their way up here. Um, this is just a, a note, someone complimenting you on the branding and the customer experience, it's A1, uh, hashtag happy customer. So someone out there has had a, a great brand experience. But this is an interesting question because I see a lot of this traffic coming through and on, the, on your social media. Yeah. Someone asked, can you talk about the well-known figures who have visited StockX and what their visits to StockX in Detroit means to the company? Yeah. Um, so having Dan as a co-founder, um, creates interesting um, dynamics. Um, you know, and normally you're spending every sort of waking hour trying to figure out how you're gonna fund the business and, 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 uh, and keep it alive. And so in the beginning, we were super fortunate to just, just work on the business and didn't have to worry about that. Um, and then what happens because of Dan and, and the Cavs and the NBA and sneakers, um, it caught the attention of a lot of notable people. And the first two were really Mark Wahlberg and Eminem. And, um, and they were helping us anyway. And so they were helping us anyway. And so the, first, the question was, well, like the greatest value I could give to them was to allow them to invest. And so we created a, for our first round. It was all sort of big names, um, small checks, Eminem, Mark Wahlberg, Drake, a couple other professional sports owners. Um, and the function was um, to allow those strategic people to, to help us. And then as that grew, um, it's just... We're, we're so fortunate to sell the most highly coveted products in the world. Nike, Louis Vuitton, Supreme, Rolex, right? right? To be in the middle of all this. And so for us, we're constantly trying to figure out how do you um, leverage that, leverage the relationships to be able to work with, with the most famous people in the world as a means of just growing the brand and, and from a marketing standpoint. At the end of the day, it's 100% just a, a marketing function, but some people are investors, some people have you know, influencer deals and, and we, we pay them or we give them product. Um, other people are, are just interested in, in creating content for, for whatever they're involved in. But there's so much dovetailing of all of this right now between sneakers, sports, uh, music, um, you know, celebrities, uh, uh, you know, streetwear, all this sort of coming together and we just happen to be in the middle of it and I, I never in a million years thought my uh, job in my life was going to be hanging out with celebrities and, and like, but that's what I do. So I don't know. <laughs> like, it's. I mean, the value to me is incredible because I mean, I could, you know, Dan and I were talking backstage about he was disappointed that the Amazon folks never really took the time to come here and visit before yeah. giving us the thumbs down. And I've always said, and this has been for decades, if people come here and visit, their, sure. their whole mindset about the city of Detroit will change. And where they may have been, have no opinion or even been negative, they leave being evangelists oh. because they see what's happening. Absolutely. So you bringing all these cats to town, yeah. I mean, it's incredible because they don't just come and then come to your office and leave. No, no, no. They, they stay in a hotel, they walk around downtown, they take the Bruce tour, they go to restaurants, and then they leave saying, wow, Detroit's dope. Right. And honestly, oh, um, no matter who it is, no matter how big or important they are, we try to make make everybody go on the tour and see everything regardless. Like, if you don't have, a, you know, 90 minutes, fine, we'll do a 30-minute version for you or whatever it is just to see that because it, it, um, it, but it also changes everything for us because then we get to play off of sort of how we fit into that ecosystem and, you know, our, our logo is now on the side of the building and, and, and to do that. And so it's... Um, it's a really um, extraordinary place. And by the way, it's led to some of those people coming back and, and creating businesses or making investments into different businesses in the city other than, than StockX right. because of, of those introductions and those things that have happened. And, and that's, that's, that's cool. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So should we, let's look for something, man. Yeah, I mean, if you want me to, to buy you something here, we do that. Let's see. Maggie, can we, can we help Josh help me find uh -huh. something? Yeah, I think here we're logged in, I think. Is so, this up top? Are we seeing this? We're, we're, we're about to, there we go. All right, so, all right, so I'm digging the Virgil. I, I honestly was like, I was like, we'll buy him a five thousand dollar pair of sneakers if we're sitting here. But um, so I'm digging Virgil. Yeah. So why, why, why the, the Virgil, the new, uh, the off white all right. you get Air to, Maxes? You get to choose the product, right? right. Um, but I want to, I want to use this as an opportunity to show basically how this is different than every other form of commerce that exists, because this really isn't about sneakers. 
Right. Uh, it's really about the thing. So, like, well, if, if you want to go to watches, yeah. No, no, it's a fine. It, right. it, there's a lot of liquidity in, in this. <laughs> so, like off-white Air Max, right? Yeah. All right. So, like anything else, we can just search and find what whatever product we want to search. Um, which is, internet's pretty slow. This is going to be painful if the internet's is slow. Uh, let's go back and see if we can just go right to a product okay. page. I don't think that we are. I think the internet's not working. I don't know, Maggie, are we connected to the internet? She says we are. It's just slow. This nope. site can't be reached. By the way, we planned this. This is not our fault, technical difficulty. Yeah, yeah. All right, we won't right. talk about this anymore. So let's talk about totally We try. Dying. I was totally going to just, because his credit card's in here. I was going to, all right. So, here, let, so let, let me explain this part, because here's the thing. You go to, um, you want to sell a, uh, a pair of shoes on eBay, right? You list it for sale, right? And you hope someone comes and buys it. But if you sell, a, want to sell a share of Nike stock, you don't go list it for sale and and write a description and explain what your Nike stock is and hope someone comes and buys it or let six people bid on. It. Like no, like you go to the stock market. Nike's trading at seventy bucks a share, and you can sell it immediately whenever you want to sell it. Right. And that's fundamentally the, the main difference. There's a whole lot of stuff, there's a whole lot of data, but at the core of it, because it, this, is, this is just supply and demand, and we're able to basically aggregate demand. The way the stock market works, right? People are placing bids on a product they want, and then people are placing asks of what they want to sell. But those bids, a, li a live bid on StockX is tied to someone's PayPal or their credit card. And so what that does is it gives you the market price for, for you to sell it. Every other form of e-commerce, there's a buy button and a price. On StockX, there's also a sell button and a price in the same way that there's a, a sell button for, for Nike stock if you want to sell it. Right. So if you want to sell the, the, these shoes that I'm wearing or, or any pair of shoes, you don't have to list anything for sale ever. Like there's a standing bid there and you can just accept it in the same way that you can sell a share of Nike stock. And that's like when we talk about the fact that it's a stock market, it's not about investments, right? It is about the method of connecting buyers and sellers. Because that's all we are. We are a marketplace that connects buyers and sellers. It is an evolution of, of eBay. But how we do that is the exact same way that the world's stock markets work. And that's the big idea. That's why this thing has, has reached a billion dollars in three years. And, and it's still just the beginning. Because it is really about that unique nuance. And like the best part about this is we didn't make that up, right? All we did was pointing it from these commodities, from stocks and bonds and oil and gas to sneakers and streetwear and watches and handbags. Now what I found fascinating, and we would have looked at it up here, is that you know you can go click on your own portfolio. Mm -hmm. You can follow the value of your sneaker collection. But you can also look at any number of people's portfolios. And so you may not know who it is, people have their different login names, but you can go and there's people on there with five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars worth of sneakers. Yep. And it breaks out what they have, what percentage of their portfolio is Nike, Adidas, Asics, Reebok. It's really amazing. And it fluctuates every day, just like your stock portfolio. Yeah. And not only that, there's also indices on the homepage. So, and there's a stock ticker. And, and the indices and stock ticker on the site, um, and the indices, there's a Jordan index, a Nike index, an Adidas index. Um, it's real data, like right. it's the actual real data going through, and you can't invest in those indices today, but eventually you will be able to, like 100%. Eventually you will be able to invest in a Jordan index in the same way you'd invest in the Dow Jones or, or S&P. So it's an interesting question, and so I'm a, I'm a big supporter of financial literacy, particularly for Detroit That's public school students. So this question is, uh, have you thought through the potential of using StockX as a way to teach Detroit youth about the stock market. Yeah, you know, with a, a, only a little bit of time left, I'm actually, this is awesome. This is probably the last question that we'll go in. So, as I mentioned, I spend most of my time doing one of two things, either talking to brands or, or this and, and speaking. And by far the best opportunity to speak is when I'm invited to speak at schools. And I've spoke everywhere from middle school to grad school, and it's almost always a teacher or professor who'd been using StockX to teach their kids about supply and demand, economics, mm -hmm. the stock market, investing, something like that. And then I get to go there and, and talk about it. And it's always, it's by far the best. And, and um, uh, we actually spent a little bit of time working with a nonprofit around, could we create a, a, a game uh, as this mm -hmm. company had been using games to, to teach kids in, in that process. And so I think it's something that we will sort of dig into more. Um, right now, it's, it's usually localized to me being able to go and talk to people. But um, when I started Campless in early 2012, 
and it started to get a little bit of traction. About a year into it, I got an email, and this is still this, the singular uh, most, I don't know, important thing that's happened in, in six years of doing this. I get an email, totally random email, and this guy starts, he says, I have a 17-year-old son. I thought he was selling drugs. I took a closer look, and I realized he's actually selling sneakers. And now I've been using your site to do it with him. And then went into this very long and touching thing about how he hadn't like, connected with his son, and this is what they do together, and this whole thing. And it was just, you know, and like I have a, I have a, I have a son, and I have a father, and it was like a, a, I still remember that more than anything else. And um, and I was like, man, like that's, you know, that that was really cool. And so for us, it, it continues to be one of sort of our pillars of how we engage with the community and and charity and give back and stuff like that. Because honestly, like it's way more fun to be buying and selling sneakers than it is to be talking about whatever, you know. Sitting at a desk at IBM. Yeah, right. Well, that too. But yeah. So look, I, mean, I appreciate as, as uh, an entrepreneur in the city of Detroit in more traditional businesses, I appreciate uh, you kind of bringing the tech world to Detroit. The traditional Silicon Valley uh, investment funds uh, are now looking at Detroit mm -hmm. in large part because of what you've been able to do here. And I hope that other young entrepreneurs, some of those kids that come take tours of StockX will at some point become the next Josh, uh, you know, the next Sedel uh, of, of their era. And so we appreciate you being here. I would encourage everyone in the audience, uh, since we kind of flubbed here on getting online, is go check out this, this site, download the app. It's incredible. Uh, sneakers, streetwear, watches and handbags, art is soon to follow. It's truly a stock market of things, and we're glad that you're doing it in Detroit. Thank you so My much man. for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah.